Welcome to Wicked Week here at Darkcast Network. I'm Jasmine of Hands Off My Podcast, host for this episode of Darkcast Network's Wicked Week. Double, double, toil and treble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. You guessed it, this episode is all about witches. <laughs> But don't be too frightened, dearies. I've cast a protective spell upon you for good luck. Hey everybody, welcome to Sinister Story Hour. My name is Steph. Fear can be such a terrible emotion that causes us so many other feelings and physical reactions, like a visceral reaction in my gut is what immediately comes to mind just to help us escape from the chaos. Case in point, let's say you're scared of spiders. Uh, yeah, me too. If you see one, your blood pressure might spike. Like me. I get sweaty, I get panicked, I definitely scream, I develop the it's either him or me kind of line of defense until somebody finally gets rid of the spider. Other things that we might be fearful of can incite other emotions or a physical reaction, such as paranoia, irrational anger, or tears, just to name a few. When people fear other people, the results can be devastating. In the 1600s, Mal Dyer was one such woman that the other folks in her Leonardtown, Maryland village feared most. No one knew Maul's backstory, and no one bothered to ask either. Instead, they made up stories about Maul, which is so common even today in 2023. We do this all the time. We haven't changed. Stories that once she was a beautiful lady who was born with a silver spoon in her mouth and the spoils and riches of a well-to-do family, a handsome young suitor that had come to call on Maul and she was smitten, But the young man met with a treacherous fate, and Maul was left heartbroken. Now the villagers considered Maul an old hag. And since no one bothered to get to know her, the other townsfolk grew to fear and hate the old woman. Unless they needed something from her, that is. See, Maul was widely known as a healer. If an outbreak of influenza hit the village, Everyone and their Uncle Fred went to see Maul for recovery. Maul lived in a ramshackled house, and her looks were mostly the reason that the other townsfolk shunned her. She stood tall, and she had a long gait. Her gaze when she looked at you was cold and baneful. The citizens of Leonardtown were positive that Maul was a witch. During the summer months, Maul would walk around the town gathering weeds and herbs that she would find to make teas and tinctures. She would sometimes ask residents for small handouts. Most dared not to deny Maul for fear that she would put a curse on them. In the winter of 1697, a bitter storm hit in February. The villagers were getting sick and dying. In spite of the many years that Maul had helped to heal the townsfolk, this year was different. This year the people were looking for someone to blame for their unfortunate luck and unfortunate weather. This year, it had to be a spell that Maul had cast to wreak havoc on their village. Maul lived in the outskirts, her tiny home on the edge of the woods. The townspeople lit torches and marched through the freezing snow to Maul's home. No longer would they allow the Witch of the Woods to control them. The angry mob used their torches to light Maul's humble shack ablaze. Maul, who was terrified of the townspeople who turned on her suddenly, ran from her home into the woods. Satisfied they had destroyed the town witch forever, the villagers returned to their homes. They could now rest easy that the root of all their troubles was gone. There were no immediate signs of Maul's existence after the shack burning incident. Several days later, a boy looking for cattle that he had lost came upon Maul's frozen body kneeling over a large boulder 
hand stretched to the sky as if cursing the people who had done this to her. The boulder she had died on has been preserved and lays in front of the Leonardtown Colonial Jail. It is said that there's an impression of her knee and hand still upon the rock. There are tales of Maul's spirit haunting the land that she died on. And honestly, I would haunt it too. Her spirit is most active on freezing cold nights. One last tidbit, the story of Maul Dyer is said to have been the inspiration for the movie The Blair Witch Project. Again, this is Sinister Stuff of Sinister Story Hour Podcast. And thank you for listening. Have a very witchy Halloween. Hey, hey, I'm Autumn from Autumn's Oddities, and please enjoy the spooky tale that's Sleepy Hollow adjacent. I give you the Witch of West Nyack. In the hamlet of West Nyack, six miles from Sleepy Hollow as the raven flies, there is a historic marker at the site of the last witch trial in New York State, one Jane Kniff. Some versions of her story use the name Hannah instead of Jane. Others recall local Dutch farmers referring to her as not, I don't understand that, Kniff, N-A-U-T, Kniff, which was a salutation of unknown meaning and origin, so I have no answers for anyone. Whatever her given name was, descriptions of Kniff are wildly cartoonish. Like so many accused witches, Kniff was just a marginalized person living on the edge of society pretty much every witch ever. In early 1815 or 1816, Clarksville, as the hamlet was known then, nearly everyone was bound by ties of blood and marriage, much like the movie Sleepy Hollow. Any newly arrived stranger became the subject of gossip and rumors. Jane almost invited suspicion. Twice widowed, she was an aged woman living in an unpainted rickety house with her only child, a black cat, and a talking parrot. Unlike her plainly dressed neighbors, she wore bold colors and kept her hair in unconventional ways, and she led a mostly solitary existence. So it's just this eccentric woman... uh, She doesn't have a husband because she's widowed. She's living in an unpainted house, God forbid. And of course, you know, she's a witch just because she doesn't do things like everybody else. From her deceased husband, a Scottish physician, Kniff had learned enough about herbalism to concoct effective cures for what ails you, I guess. And adding to the matter, her son, Tobias Lowry, was also as eccentric and antisocial as his mother. There was no single act that provoked the witch trial. Rather, it was the accumulation of suspected misdeeds that turned the community against her. Local housewives who found it difficult to churn a proper butter would discover upon emptying the churn a horseshoe branded into the bottom. A prominent member of the local church passed a sleepless night due to the incessant lowing of his cows. At daybreak, he found his best milk cow inexplicably standing inside of a farm wagon. From that time forward, the cow would produce no milk. Never mind that, you know, a little heat on a cold morning would help butter to set or that the farmer's dog was known to harass the cattle. The cause, they assumed, was surely witchcraft and all eyes turned toward Jane Kniff. A later historian surmised that neither a legally appointed judge nor the domini of the local reformed church would do anything but laugh at such a charge. Suspected or suspecting as much, the local citizens took the law into their own hands because this woman has done absolutely nothing wrong. There's not even a shred, an ounce, like the tiniest little bit of proof. But they decided just because she's a little bit different that she's the one making their butter Uh, not churn and putting a cow in a cart, really. Like, this is something to try a person over? I don't think so. Only upstanding citizens, of course, would be allowed to act on such a serious charge as witchcraft, resulting in nomination of the resident physician for judge and jury of neighboring farmers. In the early 1800s, medical practice was, as we know, a far cry from today's industrial medicine. 
So was the physician judge truly impartial? Or was he pissed that he had competition from a more competent female practitioner? Like, medicine back in the day was absolutely nothing. Whatever she was doing was probably helping more. You know, they were like, you got ghosts in your blood, do cocaine about it. I'm going to put a leech on you because you're, you know, your butt hurts. I don't know. I, I, It's all very scientific. It's not, actually. But the good citizens held a secret meeting at Pie's Woodmill, or Wool Mill, mill sorry, weird words, Wool Mill, at which they decided the test would be the ancient practice of dunking, in which the alleged witch is bound by hand and foot and thrown into a body of water. We know it. We've seen it a million times. In earlier times in Western Europe and also America, an alleged witch who floated would be found guilty of witchcraft and executed. If the alleged witch sank and drowned, well, the innocence of the unfortunate defendant would be beyond doubt. You know, she's she's not guilty, but she is dead. So guilty or innocent, the accused did not survive the trial. You know, you, it's just a double-edged sword. There's no winning. So Kniff was apprehended. She was bound hand and foot and carted off to the nearest pond. But before she was cast into the water, a separate gr- group of locals happened upon the gathering, if you want to call it that. Other counsel prevailed, and instead of the water test, the jury decided to use the enormous flower scales at Albert Palhemus's grist mill to weigh Caniff against a Bible. I've never heard of this witch test. This is a new one for me. And this was no, like, regular church pew Bible just weighing a couple of pounds. This was a Dutch family Bible with a capital B. The great book was itself huge, covered with wood boards and bound in iron with an iron carrying chain. It's very high fashion. It is couture. Uh, If outweighed by such a hefty tome, she would be a witch beyond doubt and suffer accordingly. Yeah, so they wrapped a freaking massive Bible in wood and iron chains simply to make it weigh more than her. And against her protest, Kniff was put in the scales and weighed. Writing in 1886, Frank B. Green very dryly observed, quote, Weighing more than the Bible, the committee released her amid the ominous shaking of heads at the decision of the judges. Her persecutors were threatened with an action at law. So it didn't work, even though they wrapped this Bible in wood and iron chains. She apparently weighed more than it. Good for her. Kniff was released, ending the inglorious last witch trial in New York State. Or did it really end there? A short time later, one of Pi's children is alleged to have met a gruesome fate at the wool mill where the committee had first plotted the witch trial. Through some accident, a large wooden hammer weighing hundreds of pounds, which was used for beating out wool cloth, fell on the child, crushing and killing him. This was, of course, attributed again to Jane Kniff, for her brutal treatment at the hands of her, you know, zealot neighbors. Nothing remains today of the Palmas Mill, formerly the de Clark Mill at the southwest corner of Grimond's Road and Strawtown Road. Just a historic marker noting its historic significance as the site of the last witch trial in New York State. I hope you enjoyed that spooky short tale. And if you like what you hear, you can hear more episodes released every Tuesday and Friday on all podcast platforms. Thank you for listening. And remember, if it's creepy and weird, you'll find it here. Hey, everybody. This is Josh. And this is Jamie. From the Paranormal Peeps podcast. And we are going to talk vampires. Yeah. So normally we do mostly ghosty stuff, but... You know, it is spooky season and we're going to branch out just a little bit. Because after all, it's fun. It is fun. So we are going to talk the legend of Sava Safanovic. Interesting name. (laughs) That's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. It is also (laughs) Serbian. Yes. So the story of Sava Safanovic is one of the most famous and fascinating folktales from Serbia. It is a story of love loss, madness, and ultimately the supernatural. The legend of Sava is one that has been deeply etched in the cultural memory of the Serbian people and continues to be retold to this day. The story begins in the small village of Zorzoji, where Sava lived. He was a successful cattle trader and brave Hajduki, a member of society known and appreciated for both his courage and wealth. Sava lived unmarried with his brother and his brother's family in a common house. 
One day, Sava fell in love with the daughter of a local merchant. Despite his efforts to marry the young woman, he was denied because of the great age difference. This rejection led to a deep change in Sava. He became bitter, spiteful, and quarrelsome. People began to avoid and fear him. One day, after a night of waiting outside, Sava sought out the young woman who was driving cattle to pasture. After a short exchange of words, he shot the woman and possibly others present. In the act, Sava also dramatically lost his own life, in some accounts by suicide, in others by strangulation by villagers involved. After his death, as custom dictated, Sava was buried not in the churchyard but near the crime scene. But that was not the end of the story. The villagers reported that they had seen Sava at night or had even been followed by him. The situation escalated when several millers who had worked and stayed overnight in the water mills on the edge of the river were found dead. All of them were shown bite marks on their necks. It was clear to the villagers that Sava had become a vampire. In their fear, the villagers decided to take action. They opened Sava's grave and found an undecaying corpse inside. To break the curse, they drove a pointed stake through the vampire's heart. According to some locals, when they dug him up, Sava is said to have opened his eyes. They drove a stake through his chest. Supposedly, a butterfly flew out and the priest failed to pour holy water in time. It is said that this butterfly plagued people for a long time and many believe that it still plagues them today. So Sava Sagnanovich is among the first known cases by the name of a folk belief in vampires native to the Balkans. In Serbian folklore, he is usually considered to be the first vampire. The legend of Sava probably originated in the 17th or 18th century and is closely connected with the interest in vampirism in Western Europe at the time. Reports of vampires and other mystical beings were, were not uncommon in those regions. There were reports of vampires until into the late 19th century. In oral accounts of encounters with unknown beings exist until the first half of the 20th century. Although the stories surrounding Sava can never be fully proven historically, they are an essential part of the Serbian folk tradition. The seclusion of this dilapidated mill contributes to an atmosphere shrouded in ominous mystery. For the curious tourist or vampire-loving visiting western Serbia, the mill in Zarzoji is an unforgettable destination. Despite its collapse, parts of the structure have been preserved and stabilized. The mill is located in the middle of a dense forest along the Babbling River, which is now peaceful but still exudes an eerie presence if you know the legend. Guided tours are occasionally offered, during which the story of Sovanovich is told in exciting detail. As long as the legends are passed down, the memory of the vampire lives on. Sava is remembered as one of the most eerie and fascinating legendary figures in Serbia. Wow, pretty cool. It would be really neat to be able to travel there and go see what's left. Yeah. Of the structure. Yeah, there's not much left. It's just like a, a little like shack almost sitting yeah. by the river. Yeah. It'd still be really cool to go see. It would be. I mean, we hear these stories. We read these stories. You know, they've been passed down generation through generation. To be able to go and get a visual, even if it's not much. Yeah. Of where it supposedly took place and, and all that. And to know the story behind it would actually be really cool. It would be really neat. Yeah. I can think the one part that is really strange and isn't explained at all in the story is that butterfly. Yeah, what's with the butterfly? Like, butterflies are supposed to be like the transformation into something great. Right. It's the metamorphosis of one's from from child to adulthood or from something minute to something beautiful. Yes. Um, and the struggle that takes place you know yeah. to transform so i'm not sure where the butterfly comes into play or what that would mean or symbolize I you know? know i don't know i just get this picture of bart from the simpsons going nobody would suspect the butterfly <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was him ex escaping in the form of a butterfly and the priest forgot to spray it with holy water <laughs> he sprayed it too late or not in time yeah. So, I don't know. Curious. It is very curious. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I think of all stories, like vampire-wise, I've ne one, I've never heard this story. Me neither. So, it's very appropriate for spooky season. It is. And everybody, if you enjoyed this story, come find us out on Paranormal Peeps Podcast. Yeah. Come give us a listen and happy Halloween. I'm Dawn from Scottish Murders, and this is the story of Christian's Coven. 
In the early 1700s, the daughter of the Laird of Bargarin, Christine Shaw, was a Scottish industrialist and was widely regarded as being the founder of the thread industry in Renfrewshire in Scotland. This was after Christine travelled to the Netherlands and observed the spinning techniques there, along with seemingly smuggling some of the necessary equipment back to Scotland in her luggage. This allowed for the spinning of a more durable and whiter yarn of thread known as Bargarin thread back home in Renfrewshire. However, it would be the spinning a yarn of a different kind as a child in the late 1600s that would also carry the Bargarin name, but in a far darker and shocking way. The late 1600s were just a decade or so before those beginnings of the Renfrewshire thread industry, but would seem like centuries before in comparison, where fears were more primitive and the people persuaded more easily. In 1696, it would be in Paisley in Renfrewshire, where a young 11-year-old Christian Shaw would become part of a thread of events which would shock then and echo through the centuries to now. Christian, as the daughter of John Shaw, who was the Laird of Bargarin, led a relatively privileged life living in Bargarin House. This included her father and landowner keeping servants. And one day, Christian saw one of the servants, Catherine Campbell, stealing a drink of milk, and so she reported this to her mother. When the servant, Catherine, discovered what Christian had done, she cursed the young girl by wishing that the devil would haul her soul through hell. This could easily be dismissed as an offhand remark delivered in anger if this had been, in the later industrial age of Renfrewshire, that the older Christian herself would help start, but this was a very different Renfrewshire of Christian's more sensitive youth. It would be a few days later when Christian Shaw encountered Agnes Naismith, an elderly woman described as being addicted to threatenings, who lived alone and was known for speaking her mind, and she inquired how Christian was feeling to which Christian replied she was feeling fine. However, the day after the encounter with Agnes asking about her health, and a few days on from the curse from the servant Catherine, Christian fell ill. She began to have seizures, at times was unable to see or hear, and her body would extend or contract violently. She was clearly no longer feeling fine. However, as her illness progressed, so did the nature of her symptoms, which went from those not unlikely of a serious illness to others which included apparently spitting out feathers, her own hair, carcasses of small animals, and even something that wouldn't seem out of place in her later life, pins. Whatever was really happening, Christian's parents would have been rightly concerned for their daughter, but they believed that she was cursed. This was seemingly confirmed in their eyes when for a short period Christian recovered and told her parents she could see the family servant, Catherine, who had stolen the drink of milk, and the old woman, Agnes, of whom people at the time would have accused of being a witch, stabbing at her sides and threatening to cut her open. It would be two months before Christian Shaw's parents, concerned for their young daughter's health, would head the 11 miles or 18 kilometres to Glasgow to see the skilled physician Dr Matthew Brisbane. You would assume that a visit to the more rational doctor would help find out the true cause of Christian's poor health, but instead it was stated that while in his surgery, Christian spat out a coal cinder as large as a chestnut and almost too hot for Dr Brisbane to handle, which caused the doctor to state that her symptoms were beyond what is normal or natural. Many other fantastical symptoms exhibited by Christian included citing scriptures and concepts beyond her years, seeming to fly unaided across her classroom, and picking up a glove without using her hands. She would even at times plead with her unseen Catherine Campbell to resume their friendship, which had ended due to her reporting the theft of the drink of milk to her mother. A week after Christian and her parents had visited the doctor in Glasgow, which had produced no true explanation for their daughter's affliction, Christian did recover, albeit briefly, before her fits returned, but this time more violent than before. Still left with no answers as to what was happening to Christian, her parents turned to their local parish minister, who stated that the young Christian was possessed and was being tormented by witches something that was unfortunately quite commonly thought of at the time, and many of her symptoms matched those from the Salem witch trials a few years earlier in America. And interestingly enough, America had recently been visited by Christian's father, John Shaw, the Laird of Bergeron. 
The church set up a weekly fast and prayer meetings at Bergarin House, and Christian Shaw's father appealed to the authorities that those named by his daughter should be arrested. Although it was overlooked at the time, Agnes Naismith, the elderly woman Christian had encountered and who had asked about her health, appeared to genuinely be concerned about Christian and she visited her at Bergarin House, where she prayed for her and wished her a speedy recovery. Although Catherine Campbell seemingly stated, according to John Miller's account, recorded in his collection The Witches of Renfrewshire, that the devil never let Christian grow better. Although only two people were initially named by Christian, which included the servant and the old woman she encountered, the list of the accused grew to include 20 women, 10 men and 5 other men or women as being part of a coven of witches that Christian blamed for her possession. The Scottish Privy Council set up a commission to investigate the events surrounding Christian Shaw at the request of the church in Paisley to see if there was a case against those accused, and seven of those names, which included Catherine Campbell and Agnes Naismith, along with Margaret Lang, John Lindsay, James Lindsay, John Reed and Margaret Fulton, were summoned for trial and appeared at a second commission in Paisley charged with murder and tormenting a number of people, including Christian Shaw. The others did not face trial, as their relatives were seemingly able to use their standing in society to buy them out of what became known as the Renfrewshire Witch Trials, by offering what lands and goods they could. However, that was not possible for the other seven, which included John and James Lindsay, who were only 11 and 14 at the time. The advocate for the seven who stood trial argued that the prosecution was obliged to rule out the possibility that the events could be explained by natural causes, but Dr Matthew Brisbane gave evidence that he could not find any such cause for Christian Shaw's condition. There were also seemingly witches' marks found on the bodies of the accused, and doubt was cast on any reasonable explanations for those marks which were offered by other physicians. The prosecutor confronted the jury, saying if the defendants were acquitted, then those on the jury would be accessories to all the blasphemies, atrocities, murders, tortures and seductions, going on to say that those enemies of heaven and earth shall hereafter be guilty when they get out. This gave the jurors little choice but to find all seven of those accused guilty, based upon the words of 11-year-old Christian Shaw. After the guilty verdict was delivered, James Reed decided his own fate by taking his own life in prison, but the other three men and three women were to be strangled and burnt on the Gallow Green in Paisley in June 1697 in front of a large and boisterous crowd. This included Catherine Campbell, who was carried struggling and screaming to the gallows and calling down the wrath of God and the devil on her accusers and Agnes Naismith, who seemingly laid a dying woman's curse on everyone present and their descendants, where for many years afterwards, every tragedy in the town was blamed on this witch's curse. However, the deaths of those who would become known as the Bergarin witches would be the last mass execution for witchcraft in Western Europe. The remains of the dead were buried at a crossing known today as Maxwellton Cross and a horseshoe was placed on top of their buried remains, which went missing a few years later. In 2008, this was replaced with a bronze plaque featuring a stainless steel horseshoe and the inscription, Pain Inflicted, Suffering Endured, Injustice Done, in a tribute to make sure people never forget the true tragedy of those who had suffered and died based merely on a yarn spun by a young girl who would of course live to grow up and spin those yarns of a different kind. Hello everyone, my name is Raven and I'm the host of Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how the misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. As part of the Darkcast Network, and honoring the spooky season, I wanted to share a chilling tale about a mysterious woman from the past who was said to be a witch, and who was said to ultimately take her own life by drinking her own blood. This is the horrifying tale of Lona the Bloodthirster. Let's go rogue and get right into today's chilling crime, the case of a young woman from Romania who was accused of being a Satan worshipper and blood drinker, whose death had presumed ties to the occult 
involving ritualistic practices of drinking her own blood that was said to be the ultimate cause of her death. So with what may seem like a work of vampiric fiction, let's delve into the case of the infamous Lona the Bloodthirster. But first, let's start off from the very beginning. Traveling back to the year of 1909, when anything pertaining to witchcraft and the occult, or even anything outside of Christianity, was condemned with the penalty of death. A pair of ministers reportedly accused a 27-year-old woman of the Romanian city, Timisora, of not only being a witch for her devout involvement in Zoroastrianism, but they even rumored that she had killed and drank the blood of several local children, building a fear of her base solely off of her involvement in a religion that was different than their own. Upon hearing of these presumed acts of devilry, a mob of angry locals gathered, hunted down, and savagely beat young Lona to an inch of her life. Lona was said to be taken to the local hospital to treat her for her injuries, but it's said that after being in the hospital for only two days, she reportedly checked herself out and returned to her home, presumably to care for herself and get some much-needed rest in the comfort of her own home. Much to many surprise, though, the very next day after she had checked herself out of the hospital, Lona was reportedly found dead, lying on her sofa, with her arms crossed over her chest. When local authorities came to her home to investigate the scene, they were shocked to find that it looked like Lona had performed a crude satanic ritual the night prior, with an altar next to the sofa she was lying on, adorned with occult symbols, ritualistic herbs, and pagan statues. Atop the altar was said to be a goblet that contained a deep, dark, red stains within it, which authorities determined to be blood. It wasn't just any blood, though, either. Instead, it was concluded to be Lona's own blood, with which she drank on the night of her hospital checkout. Upon seeing the blood-stained goblet, authorities proceeded to inspect Lona's corpse at the scene for any additional clues as to what may have caused her passing, and they noted that although she was fully clothed upon inspection, they saw several cuts all over her arms and legs, indicating self-harm as a means to obtain the blood that was within the goblet. Lona's body was then taken to the morgue for an official autopsy, and the medical examiner there reportedly stated that she had died from a combination of blood loss and internal shock from ingesting massive quantities of blood that then ultimately triggered cardiac arrest. Through drinking her own blood in an assumed ritual, Lona ultimately died of a provoked heart attack. By cutting her own body, draining herself of her blood, and then catching the blood in a goblet to be drank, after repetition of these acts, Lona was believed to have committed ritualistic suicide. As was common back then, post-mortem pictures were often taken of the dead, and there is such an image of Lona herself that was taken at the scene of her death, which shows her deceased body on the sofa. The photo has a rather eerie feel to it, as if she is not dead, but instead, sleeping peacefully on the sofa. Many people claim that the photo was cursed, and that many who post the image online or through social media have said to have nightmares thereafter, or have woken up to find their body covered in bruises and scratches, much like how Lona's body was found due to the beating she endured and the self-inflicted scratches from her ritual blood draining. To add a twist to the seemingly grim tale, the actual validity of such a story revolving around the photo is very much debated to this day. Records of such a person, named Lona Constantinescu, is incredibly hard to come by, leaving many to speculate that the tale was actually a fabrication of possible real-life events that may have occurred in the time frame. Another common point that skeptics of the story point out is that on the post-mortem photo of the presumed Lona, the lady within the photo clearly does not look like someone who had been brutally beaten a few days prior. Rather, as mentioned, it looks like a young woman who was peacefully sleeping on a sofa. The actual name and story of Lona the Bloodthirster can, at the time, be traced back to an anonymously written poem by an author only known as Unholy. The title of the poem being called Lona the Bloodthirster. The poem recounts the horrific story of Lona's beating and unfortunate death, yet the validity of such a person actually existing is still very much unknown. The poem goes as follows. Lona Constanescu died in the autumn of 1909. Her cause of death? Ritual suicide. By purposeful ingesting of large quantities of her own blood. 
stated and concluded the official autopsy and coroner's reports. Timisoara, Romania, October 23. She called it the communion of the saints. 27-year-old Lona was laid to rest in a private ceremony. She was known to many throughout the township of Timisoara in western Romania as a witch and an idolater. Many feared her. Many knew the stories of alleged hemoingestin and unknown strigwekwa in the wood. She was considered against by two Christian ministers and their wives to drive out the devil from their midst and cleanse the northern gods from among us. Just before dawn on October 21st, she was dragged from her home by a mob and beaten near unto death. She spent the next two days drinking continually from the communion glass. Both ministers and their wives were dead before the end of the year. If you enjoyed this spooky story, then please be sure to check out Rogue Darkness wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time. Hey there, I'm CJ with Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ. While over in America, witches were on trial and being hanged when found guilty, in Europe, things were just a little bit different. Oh, the persecution of witches was still prevalent thanks to the Catholics and Christians' fear of demons. Tens of thousands of women were being gathered and slaughtered for being witches. And heavens forbid a woman was born a lesbian and like the ladies. If she did and took a female lover, it had to be the work of a demon or the devil himself possessing her. Although sexual identity wasn't really a thing back then, at least not what we know it as today. There were no labels, just feelings and attractions. If a person was born gay and had same-sex attractions, they knew to hide it because anything that was not considered societal normal was demonic. Funny, not much different than today according to some people. The purging of witches in Europe started in the 1400s and it continued on through the mid-1700s. Witch hunters, many who were clergymen, would seek out women with what they deemed to have unusual behavior. One of the tests to find out if a woman was an actual witch was called the swimming test. The woman was tied up, thrown into the water. If she drowned, she was not a witch. She was dead forever, but at least she wasn't a witch. If she fought and was able to unbind herself and get out of the water, or if she figured out how to float and stay alive, she was a witch who had helped to escape from the devil himself. Now, I personally would have considered that woman a badass if she was able to survive, but not the folks back then. They burned these women at the stake. It sounds like if you were suspected of being a witch back then, you were damned either way. There's some very heinous murders of presumed witches in the world's history for sure. In the English channels, a fight ensued between Protestants and Catholics. Three Protestant women presumed to be witches were tied to a stake and lit a fire. As the fire started to burn, one of the women gave birth. The baby was pulled from the fire at first, but then it was tossed back in because it was believed to be a descendant of the devil. There was a woman named Katharina Heno in Germany. Today, she would be considered a successful businesswoman. But back in the early 1600s, her being assertive was considered aggressive and manlike. In fact, many women who came across as too independent, they were forced to wear a muzzle in public. This would hinder the woman quiet. Katharina came from a family of successful politicians. She was born into her behavior. And if it wasn't in her genes, it was a learned behavior from her family. She was accused of being a witch and practicing witchcraft, which she denied. However, she wasn't believed, so she was tortured and eventually sentenced to death. But her jurors and judge, they decided they'd do her a solid, since her family was a prominent family in the community. They strangled her before they burned her. Gee, thanks guys. Thanks for killing me before killing me. In all honesty, with the exception of Iceland, who went on witch hunts for men, nearly all the other witch hunts in Europe were predominantly for women, 
especially in Scotland. Maud Galt was one of these Scottish women. Maud was born in 1620, and if she were alive today, she'd be 403 years old. She's probably happy she's not alive today. Can you imagine being 403 years old? During a good portion of Maud's life, Scotland was going through what was called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. This was a religious war with England, and all about the reform of religion. Protestants, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians, they all had one thing in common. The fear of demons, witches, and lesbians. Oh my! Yep, I said the L word again. Growing up, Maud knew she didn't have any attraction for boys. She liked girls. In order to live her life and her truth, Maud always knew she would need to be creative to do this. She married a man named John Dickey to be her beard, her cover-up, her disguise. Although it's unknown whether John knew he was a spouse of convenience, John was a right, W-R-I-G-H-T, which is someone who is skilled in making wooden objects. And I guess that made him Mr. Right. <laughs> he must have been pretty successful at his job because the couple was wealthy enough to have servants. Maud and John never had any children, but as I stated, they did have a couple of servants. One of these servants was a maid named Agnes Mitchell. Maud was highly attracted to Agnes. And since Maud was considered an assertive woman who went after what she wanted, she could be very persistent in her ways until she got what she desired. Some might even call her abusive in how she obtained her goal. Maud persisted with Agnes until she got her way and the two would have sexual encounters together. After a while, Agnes decided she just couldn't take what Maud was doing to her anymore and she approached what is called the Kirk Sessions. The Kirk Sessions is simply local churches holding court and proceeding over alleged criminal acts. It's a process that still goes on today in Scotland. In Agnes's Kirk session, she spilled all about the acts her employer Maud was performing on her, including using a clay phallic piece to penetrate her. We call them dildos today, and thankfully they're no longer made from clay. Agnes actually brought this clay dildo in to show the people in the Kirk session. The church was astounded when Agnes passed around the clay phallic to show the court. Agnes claimed the shame of the injury done to her prevented her from reporting these acts to the proper authorities sooner. The church court felt that Maud was being sinful trying to counterfeit a man by replicating his genitalia for a woman's pleasure. This had to be witchcraft. Damn it! You all know that means 99.9% .9 of all women today practice witchcraft. Agnes went on to tell the court Maud not only raped her, but other servants as well, including servants that worked for her neighbors. For the church, witchcraft was much easier to cope with than lesbianism. They dropped the allegations of rape that Agnes brought forth, and they decided to do their own investigation into Maud being a witch. Now, the end of Maud's story is very surprising and anticlimactic, I'm afraid. I fully expected her to be staked and lit on fire for her supposed sins. But it seems the church court dismissed her case. Maud lived to be a ripe old age of 50 in Scotland. I know that doesn't seem very old. But given it was the 1600s, and back then the average lifespan was only 35 years old, 50 was ancient. I hope you're all enjoying Dark Cast Network's Wicked Week. This has been CJ from Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ+, reporting from my Seabreeze Studios stables. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dark Cast Network's Wicked Week. We hope you enjoyed Dark Cast Network's witchy episode. Remember, life's a witch, and then you fly. We'll be back tomorrow with another great episode. 
This has been your host, Jasmine of Hands Off My Podcast. And remember, the magic within us is always greater than the magic around us. Thank you very much for listening tonight and being part of the Mythical True Crime community, hosted by me, DJ. Subscribe to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get your weekly updates. And if you like what you hear, consider subscribing. Subscribing will directly support the show and the work that I'm doing. If you'd like to be a new supporter, consider clicking the link in the description box below. For less than a cup of coffee a month, you can help me continue to make great content for listeners everywhere. No commitment cancel any time. This has been the Mythical True Crime Podcast. My name is DJ. Good night.